Hello, everyone. Welcome to um, this is going to be a bit of a longer presentation drawn out over a few days. We would normally do this in class, but as it is digital learning, um, we are going to be doing this online. So um, we are going to talk about the world of sound systems and analog audio and try to explain a few things today to help it make more sense so that you understand um, how sound travels through a sound system, what sound really is, all those kinds of things. So uh, let's just dive in. We're going to learn a lot about microphones and the such over the next few days, so stay with me. Um, what is a sound wave? Well, a sound wave is a compression and refractions of air molecules, and this is happening around you all the time. Air molecules are pushing and pulling. They don't actually ride up and down. We're going to see this in a video in just a second. They actually push and pull. As you like clap your hands together, air is being pushed out and being pulled back. And that push and pull is then traveling to your eardrums or like to the diaphragm of this microphone right now, which is also push and pulling. And it's recording that uh, pressure change in air in a graph that looks something like this with the refractions being at the bottom and the compressions being at the top. Now we should know that a sound wave is a type of acoustic energy or more specifically it's mechanical energy because it's physically an air molecule moving back and forth and it is measured by that change in air pressure. So how many molecules are bunched up together at a time versus how the molecules are being pulled apart at the time. So I think this guy does a really great job explaining it, so I'm going to let him. Sound is a wave. That is, it's a vibration that travels through a medium, like air or water. If you drop a rock into a bucket of water, you disturb the surface of the water and create ripples or waves which travel away from the impact. The ripples cause the height of the water to change, going up and down, as the wave moves away from the splash. These waves are visible with our eyes and have a number of properties. They have a maximum point called a crest, a minimum point called a trough, they have a wavelength which is the distance from a particular crest to the next one, they have an amplitude which is the distance from the center line to the top of a crest or to the bottom of a trough, they have a frequency which is the number of waves that pass a fixed point per second, they have a speed, which is just wavelength times frequency, and they have a direction. Sound waves are similar. If you clap your hands in a quiet room, you will disturb the air and cause ripples of air to move away from your hands. The clap disturbs the air molecules near your hands. These molecules then bounce into other nearby molecules, and so on, so that the disturbance moves through the air like a wave, a sound wave. But sound waves are different to water waves in one respect. Water waves are transverse. This means that as the wave is moving in one direction, say to the right, it's creating a disturbance in the perpendicular direction, so up and down. Sound waves, on the other hand, are longitudinal. This means that as the wave is moving in one direction, say to the right, it's creating a disturbance in that same direction, so left to right. A transverse wave coming from behind lifts you up and then drops you down like a boat in the ocean, while a longitudinal wave coming from behind pushes you forward and then pulls you back like a spring. But when representing sound waves graphically, it's easier to draw them as transverse waves, so that it just looks like a regular sine graph. But really, this sine wave is the motion of the air particle as it travels through time. Another way of presenting this is that the low points on the sine wave are where air particles are spread far apart, and the high points on the sine wave are where air particles are bunched together. Sound waves cause changes in air pressure as particles bunch together and spread apart. Now we can't see these ripples, but our ears can hear them. When the waves reach our ears, the air pressure goes up and down, and this makes our eardrums go in and out at the same rate. Our brain analyzes these signals and interprets them as sound. Otherwise, sound waves have all the same features as water waves. 
They have a speed, which is naturally the speed of sound, or roughly 343 meters per second through air. And they have a frequency and a wavelength, which determines the pitch of the sound, where the shorter the wavelength, the higher the frequency, and the higher the pitch of the note. And they have an amplitude, which is the energy of the wave, and affects the volume of the sound, though it's actually a bit more complex than this. In the next few videos, we'll go into these topics in a bit more depth. Okay, we're not going to watch the next few videos, but I think you get the idea of what an actual sound wave is. Again, that's the pushing and pulling of air particles. So, what is analog? Well, analog means continuous signal. And we've talked about this since like the second week of school. The analog means continuous signal, like a clock whose second hand doesn't tick but moves slowly. Think like a Rolex. Um, that's continuous signal. That's an analog clock. In an analog audio signal, um, we're changing mechanical energy into electrical energy. And we want the electrical energy to be moving with the same consistency back and forth that the analog mechanical sound wave was. So we need to have a device which converts um, the energy from a mechanical type to an electrical type so that we can maintain that continuous signal. So how do microphones produce an analog signal? Well, um, information can be conveyed in an analog signal of many types. There are tons of physical phenomenons that can be uh, portrayed in analog signals. Old TVs, not now, but old TVs, um, would show sound and light by analog signals. So the changes in light and the changes in sound were represented by those analog signals. Sometimes you can see temperature, position, or in sound waves, pressure. Um, so for a physical variable to be converted to an analog signal, you need a transducer. And that's where the microphone comes in. The microphone is the transducer. So you have fluctuations in air, which hit the diaphragm of the microphone, which we're going to talk a little bit more about here in a minute. And those fluctuations in air pressure are going to push and pull. And there are devices to create electrical signals based on those pushes and pulls. And the better the replication of the electrical signal from the sound wave, the better the microphone. So transduction is the process of conducting or converting, excuse me, one energy from one source to a different source. A transducer is, um, in this case, a microphone transducer is converting sound energy, which is mechanical or acoustical, depending on how you look at it, to electrical energy, uh, which should represent the same shape of travel as the mechanical energy. Okay, here are a couple brief descriptions of how microphones work. How do microphones work? Though they have their differences and different uses, they are all transducers, converting sound waves to an electrical signal. The dynamic microphone is the most common used. These work using electromagnetic induction. Sound waves hit a thin diaphragm which causes it to move. This diaphragm is attached to a coil surrounded by a magnet. This magnet creates a magnetic field around the coil. The sound waves hitting the diaphragm are moving the coil and the coil's movement past the magnet creates an electrical current. This electrical current is your sound signal. Loudspeakers work in reverse. Here the incoming sound signal moves the coil, which in turn moves the diaphragm, creating sound waves. Want to learn more? Subscribe or check the sources in the description below. Okay, let's get a little more detail on that. Carry on with the overture. Microphones. Pretty much every musician has to deal with them at some point or another. How do you actually know which one to use and how to use it? To start, there are two basic types of mics that you might use. Moving coil microphones, which are most commonly called dynamic mics, and capacitor microphones, which are most commonly known as condensers. Dynamic mics are known for being rugged, affordable, and all-around useful. 
not bad at all. They don't have the crystal clear full bandwidth operation of condensers, but this is actually often a good thing, such as when you're recording certain types of drums, guitar amps, or other acoustic instruments. Condensers are good for vocals, generally somewhat fragile, and usually more expensive. They are known for their ability to capture fine detail. Condensers require some current to work. This is phantom power, which is commonly represented by a button or switch labeled as plus 48V. Microphones are a type of transducer. A transducer is something that converts energy from one form to another. In this case, they're taking sound waves and turning them into electrical energy. One, two, one, two, check, check. Though different mics work in slightly different ways, they all have a diaphragm. The diaphragm is a thin piece of material, often mylar or some form of metal, and often even gold-plated in the case of condensers. When sound strikes the diaphragm, it causes it to vibrate, and this passes energy through the rest of the microphone's components. These vibrations are converted to an electrical current, which becomes the audio signal your interface uses to capture and play back the sound. Generally speaking, smaller diaphragms are more sensitive and react faster than do large diaphragms, so large diaphragm mics are often better for voice and vocals, since they don't pick up as much annoying lip and mouth sounds. Microphones have a directionality, commonly referred to as their polar pattern. Make sure your mic is pointed in the right direction. Most small diaphragm mics are known as front address, which means that you face them directly at whatever it is you're trying to record. Large diaphragm mics are commonly front or side address, which means you have to be sure you're pointing them in the right direction. One way to tell is that in most cases the company's logo is on the front of a side address microphone. Microphones create a very weak signal, so you need what's called a preamp. Your audio interface likely has at least one of them. These will amplify the very low level electrical signal to a useful level, and it makes it possible for your audio interface to sample the fluctuating voltages more accurately. So there you go. Choose the right mic, face it in the right direction, plug it into a preamp, and then you're ready to start capturing the sounds of the world all around you. Great, so that's it. Choose the right mic, and then plug it in to a preamp, face it in the right direction, and you're essentially ready to record. So, um, it's a little more complicated than that. So let's go through, just today we're gonna go through what the difference between the dynamic and the condenser mic are, and how they function. And it's kind of significant. So, um, this is a dynamic microphone here on the left, and what we call a condenser or a capacitor microphone is on the right. I actually have an example of each. This is your dynamic microphone. It is an SM57. We have a lot of these at school for uh, students to use, but it is, uh, you'll notice on this picture, this one in the picture is an SM58. The 58 is generally used for vocal performance, and this is generally used for instrument performance. Two of the most um, highly purchased microphones on the planet right here. Um, they always work. They're rugged. They're reliable. They're brilliant. I highly recommend that if you only had one microphone to use for the rest of your life, that it would be one of these because they can do just about anything pretty well. Um, and then you have the more uh, studio style condenser. Ooh, if I turn that sideways, you can really see through it pretty good. So you can actually see uh, right in here. Um, so if you can kind of see right in here, you'll see like a circle. And that's actually the diaphragm of this microphone. That's pretty big, especially when you compare it to uh, the size of that right there. Um, so think that inside this, ooh, sorry, inside this, there's not that much uh, extra room in there, but this fills up a good bit of that. You can see that the diaphragms are a little different size. Well, that relates somewhat to their difference in sound, but let's see how they actually work different. So let me go back to the smaller screen. Okay. So how a diaphragm in a dynamic mic works. Okay. This principle works for all dynamic mics. It's actually working on the one that I'm 
uh, speaking into right now. First, you have a diaphragm. And it, you got to think about it like a really thin piece of plastic. If we were in class, I have a broken one that you can look at. But it's a really, really thin sheet of um, plastic, much like this. And it's on the microphone, and it's held mm, kind of tight, but not super tight. Now, as the air hits that plastic, it's very thin, and it makes the center of it flex back and forth as the air pushes and pulls on it. Well, attached to that plastic is a coil of wires, and you see that right here. As the plastic moves, the coil of wires move, and as the coil of wires move up and down, you are uh, moving around a magnet. Well, that creates an electromagnet or creates magnetic field, which generates electricity. Major big generators like hydrodynamic power plants and coal burning plants, they turn magnets around wires to create energy. That's just how it works. So this is actually making its own electricity. Now, we're talking a very, very, very small amount of electricity. That's why the video mentioned the preamp a minute ago. So as that coil moves up and down on that magnet, that's what's actually creating the electrical energy that goes into the microphone. Now, um, some advantages of the dynamic microphone. Again, that's uh, this little guy right here. Um, number one, it's rugged. If you notice in the video a minute ago, a guy actually nailed a nail into the wall and then used this microphone right after he did that. It, it'll take a beating and keep on ticking. Like, it's just a really good microphone. So if you're in a live sound setting and you're traveling from city to city and you don't want microphones that are going to break, you're probably going to use dynamic microphones. These are also rather affordable. This is a pretty professional level, uh, I definitely say it's a professional level, uh, dynamic microphone, it's 100 bucks. You should never pay more than 100 bucks for an SM57 unless it comes with a whole bunch of extra bits and pieces. Um, this microphone that I'm talking into is a SM7B. It's probably really one of the most expensive dynamic microphones on the market. I think it's about $400. It's a broadcast level uh, microphone for radio DJs and uh, vocalists in a studio and all that kind of stuff. So, but so for the top end, you're talking like $400. So really, that's pretty affordable. They're great for live sound um, because they resist feedback. And a large part of the reason they resist feedback is because of their frequent frequency spectrum. So if we take a look at this, hopefully this kind of looks like an EQ graph to you. So uh, if you'll notice, you don't get all the bass end. So it would be a pretty bad idea to put this microphone in front of a kick drum. It's not going to pick up the meat of the pick drum, kick drum down in here. It's also going to lose a little bit of the high-end shimmer on something like a hi-hat or um, potentially some high vocals. But um, because of this the lack of full frequency, it's not necessarily the warmest mic you're going to get. And because of the way the diaphragm is built, it's also not the most sensitive microphone for capturing subtle nuance in a vocal line. So that's a dis disadvantage of it. So the condenser mic. Uh, let's, let me remind you, this is a picture of a condenser microphone. They look more like the studios. They're in this big cage because they're so much more sensitive. If you walk on the floor past this microphone and it wasn't in this cage, you would hear your footsteps in the microphone. They're just that sensitive. So uh, in this case, instead of the diaphragm being a piece of plastic, the diaphragm here is actually a piece of metal. As the video mentioned, it's gold oftentimes. So um, the condenser itself is where the diaphragm is, and it um, is a capacitor that holds energy. So these microphones require what is called phantom power. And phantom power can... Um, come from either a battery inserted into the line or it's a 48V switch that you see on your mixing board. So um, phantom power is really important. These microphones will not work without phantom power. Because it's a capacitor, it has to charge up energy. Now, as these plates move back and forth, they move closer to one another and further away from one another, which changes the uh, resistance or the 
yeah, the resistance to the electrical flow going through. And those pushes and pulls on the resistance is what is being measured in order for the audio signal to be produced. So um, that's really important to understand that the diaphragm in this one is much different. It's actually far more sensitive. So what are the advantages of the condenser? Well, here's a frequency graph. It's almost flat all the way across. That's the big advantage. You can pick up all frequency ranges. So it's great for studio recording because they're extremely sensitive and they pick up all the subtle musical nuances you can possibly want. They're also really warm and rich in general. So they're a much fuller sounding microphone. They give a more high end sound. The disadvantages of a condenser microphone is they're often too sensitive for live performance. Because it's a little piece of metal and it's super nuancy, it will feed back really easy if you are using it in live performance. So you have to be really, really careful. Because it's a piece of a thin piece of metal, it's easy to break. If you drop this one, it's done. That diaphragm bends just a little bit and it's just not not useful anymore. Um, you never really want to pay less than two hundred dollars for a good condenser mic. And and two hundreds even skirt in the bottom edges of what you can get um, a useful condenser mic for. Really, these microphones are the ones you're using in studios that probably a typical studio microphone would average at least two grand on the condenser. Um, this uh, one that we have that I've been talking about is a student-built microphone. Um, it's a remake of what is called an AKG C414, and it's about a $1,000 microphone. Um, so you got to be a lot more careful with these. You don't typically see people taking these on the road because you don't want to travel with them and risk them being broken. If a roadie drops an SM57, you have to replace it for a hundred bucks. I'm not too mad. He drops my AKG C414 and I have to replace it. And it's a thousand bucks. I'm a lot more angry about that. So, uh, if we're going to get into polar patterns and the differences of microphones more later, but for today, that is where we're going to stop. I hope that you have found this helpful and we'll learn more about microphones in the near future.